So our plan for today, first we're going to talk about some recent developments, then um, James Katz can give a talk, and then we're hoping to open the floor up to you guys for some ideas on what you'd like to see us become next year. Um, so just one talk today, and then hopefully some discussion. So lots of interesting things happened this month, and I'll try and keep this short. Um, uh, first, Synthetic Ecology and Engineered Forum Sensing. The idea is that um, if we use a variety of different organisms, we can potentially unlock new, um, not only sensing, but also new metabolic opportunities. And, and you need to be able to coordinate members of the consortium. So this group actually uh, took two new forum sensing systems and ported them into E. coli using rational design, um, making new promoters, and also uh, doing a little bit of protein engineering, and then they characterized the crosstalk between all four different systems um, with the idea that not only do we need to know how they work, but we could also use these uh, for interesting design applications if you want a certain kind of crosstalk within your mixture. So these all use different small molecules? Yeah, they're all um, homoserial lactones, but they're, they can be orthogonal because it's shown here. Computational systems biology, uh, two groups published papers um, talking about how scaffolds can be used to sequester components and dramatically change the behavior of systems. This group showed that um, depending on the expression level of a scaffold, you can actually get very different behaviors in terms of ultrasensitivity and um, adaptivity. This group also um, characterized an existing system and introduced two new positive feedback loops a much broader bistable region that extends, extends over six orders of magnitude. Um, you've seen this work, it was presented at the uh, center opening, but it's now published. Uh, the Collins lab has made a rapid uh, detection of Zika virus with DNA to or RNA toples and um, isothermal amplification. And their big thing here is that if you start with the sequence, you can get to a clinical testing phase in less than a week. Yeah. One shout out, if you see on the author list, Nicole Derringer, <laughs> graduate of the Leonard Lab right there. <laughs> yeah. Alright, good. Um, a new system for integrating large linear fragments using CRISPR. Instead of using homology directed repair, this looks to use um, non-homologous end joining. So the idea is to use Cas9 to cut both the genome and the targeting factor, and then allow non-homologous end joining to just jam it in there. Um, and this is very high efficiency. It's so efficient that you can insert multiple linear sequences at the same locus at the same time. And it can do up to 50 kb as characterized at present. How's it going to go? So it's looking for the double strand break in the genome, and it just makes it wherever there's a double strand break, which could lead to off-target. Wait, so there are multiple targeting? So they actually did something with two different targeting factors with different antibiotic resistances and got both of them integrated at the same locus in tandem. Oh. So directionality would be a thing. Or You're like order. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, for co-culture and metabolic engineering, the Stephanopoulos lab expressed this pathway in two different E. coli strains. So the first part from glucose to DHS was expressed in one strain. And then they uh, took this last step converting DHS to 3AB and put it in 10 different um, E. coli strains to see which one could most optimally carry out that conversion. And they started out with this whole pathway of a single strain at one and a half mix per liter. And simply by breaking it up and optimizing this strain, choosing an optimal background for this expression, they got all the way up to 48 mix per liter. So choosing the correct strain for your particular step would dramatically increase the titer. Um, this group characterized some new enzymatic chemistry that should be very exciting. Um, there's a deals alder reaction that's very uh, important in chemistry, and there are some substrates that um, do not cyclize the pot heating in a traditional chemistry sense. So this enzyme can actually cyclize a substrate using this reaction mechanism, um, and it accepts non-native substrates, including some of those that do not cyclize pot heating. So this potentially opens up a, a world of chemistry that's not traditionally available through uh, typical chemistry. This is a great target for engineering. Um, a group created a reverse chirality polymerase. They actually synthesized this protein, a D polymerase, so made out of D amino acids, and showed that it could incorporate L DNTPs and L NTPs to, to do um, replication and transcription. So this is very exciting. You're kind of reversing the chirality of life here. This is the smallest known polymerase, and it's incredibly slow. It took about 36 hours to incorporate seven bases, if I remember correctly. <laughs> 
<laughs> so there's a little room for improvement there. Um, and now for the biggest news. Um, you've probably seen this. The, uh, there was a large group of scientists gathered kind of in secret at Harvard, uh, headed up by George Church, to discuss uh, synthesizing the human genome. And um, Durandi was one of those who was invited, but declined to go. And he actually went a step further and made this meeting public knowledge. And, uh, with our own Lori Zoloff, co-authored a perspective piece saying why this is a bad idea. Um, <laughs> Check out Durandi's Twitter page. Yeah, it's amazing. It's great. It's really. <laughs> um, so the latest development on this is this past Saturday, Church and Andy actually appeared together in New York City in a public panel where they began to discuss this. Um, and he called for this project to be completely scuttled, and they're they're both being very respectful to each other and calling this kind of a family feud, if you will. Um, so to get into this a little bit more, the this paper was published in Science, um, and the main reasons they want to publish it or the synthesize the human genome are to drive demand for large-scale DNA synthesis to drive down the cost. And the applications here, they want to understand basic biology through synthesizing non-coding DNA regions. Um, construct specific genotypes to study disease that don't occur naturally. Um, construct artificial chromosomes. And I didn't really understand where they were going with this. They were talking about making um, or, uh, pig organ transplants more <coughs> acceptable to humans, but also um, minimal human cells would be a great application here. Um, gene therapy, they want to improve the safety of gene therapy constructs by removing viral and cancer susceptibility. Recode human cells for safety and biocontainment and manufacturing, and create a homozygous pan human reference genome for drug testing. Um, so, what could possibly go wrong? Um, <laughs> so, this would be the most common allele of every gene, or the um, ancestral. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, Laura Zoloth and Drew and pointed out that the secrecy and lack of public dialogue leads to major trust issues, including potential consequences on the funding of the entire field. Um, every person in that room had a major material conflict of interest. Um, can't a non-human model organism genome synthesis project provide the same demand? So currently, there's already a yeast genome synthesis project. And I saw cited, I kind of doubt this number, that it's only 300 times smaller than the human genome. Um, so oh, yeah. couldn't you just synthesize 300 these genomes? But um, there was absolutely no ethical analysis undertaken or published. And again, the potential for under, under unintended consequences is huge here. Um, so they said, when the first actors at the table mostly have a significant material interest in proceeding, everyone, not just those in the room, risks out of control competition between public and private interests. Ethical conflicts of interest is a temptation to manipulate human subjects. Um, as a side note, a quarter million dollars has already been pledged to this project from a public company, uh, Autodesk. Autodesk. Um, and one of the people at this meeting works at Autodesk, oddly enough. Um, and the original paper made it clear that this project is not intended to be a nonprofit. They're already thinking of how to divvy up the patents. Um, so, what do you think? Weigh in on our website. Um, there's a, a post on GMAS that, that you should feel free to read. The links are all on there. And Join, join, join the discussion. Um, and kind of as a footnote, recently other news, a smartphone powered DNA and protein sensing device was just made by Oxford Nanopore. This is intended to be a low resource diagnostic type device. Uh, Caribou licensed CRISPR Cas9 technology extensively in the past month, first to GS for livestock engineering, to DuPont for agriculture, and to Novartis for dr drug discovery. So that's moving along quickly. Um, in the arms race between Twist and Gen 9, they both aimed major deals uh, this past month. The White House launched the National Microbiome Initiative. Vermont began mandatory labeling of GMOs. And at the same time, the National Academies declared that GMOs are completely safe, but there's no evidence that anything yet increases crop yield. And they recommended a tiered regulatory system. So that's the monthly news, and I'll hand it over to James. <laughs>